UA Radio, the official podcast of the Education Writers Association, and I'm public editor Emily Richmond. In his new book, The Years That Matter Most, How College Makes Us or Breaks Us, author Paul Toff looks at inequities in access to high-quality higher education, specifically the opportunity to earn degrees that research say lead to social mobility and even healthier and longer lives. He looks at a wealth of research and big data, and he focuses on the very real people whose lives are affected by these challenges, from high-need students waiting anxiously for their acceptance letters to the admissions officers struggling to push open the gates to higher education just a little bit wider. We're delighted he's here to make his EWA radio debut. Paul, thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me. In your previous books, you looked at issues such as community support and wraparound services for families in the landmark Harlem Children's Zone Initiative. And you also have written about resilience or grit in young children as factors in their later life success. Why do you now think the years between high school and our early 20s are the ones that matter the most? I think it came from two places. I mean, one was simply having conversations with more and more young people at the end of high school and making their way through college and understanding how critical those years were, not just in their lives, but in the trajectories of what came after. And then the data as well. I mean, the data really makes clear that now more than ever in American history, what happens, the decisions that you make and the decisions that are made for you in those years after high school have become increasingly critical. And why did you turn your focus to higher education? Your prior work has been largely on the preschool through K-12 spectrum. So in my 2012 book, How Children Succeed, there's one chapter where I wrote about an organization called One Goal and for the first time started reporting on higher ed. And, you know, that was one chapter in a longer book. So I started to look at the overall data about who was succeeding in college and how. And it seemed distressing (laughs) and important, but I didn't have time to get deeply into it in that book. But once I was done with that book, that was the thread that was most interesting to me and that seemed most important. And the further that I uh, pulled at it and followed it, the more significant it felt. And it's a pretty tangled ball of yarn, isn't it? It sure is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, K-12 education is complicated enough, but higher education is such a decentralized, disparate, autonomous system that it is hard to try to tell a story that encompasses all the complications of the higher ed landscape. You write about the research showing that when it's done correctly, higher education can be a tool of social mobility and opportunity, particularly for low-income students. But you also argue that there's been an overselling of college as the great equalizer. What went wrong? I think that's part of the complication of this story, which is it was clear both in my reporting with individual students and in the data as a whole that for individuals, higher education still does work as an engine of social mobility. I talked to lots of young people who were experiencing uh, incredible transformations through their college experience. The problem is that that opportunity is not evenly distributed. And so what the data, especially from the group of economists led by Raj Chetty, who came out with a paper uh, a couple of years ago showing this, what they concluded was that opportunity through higher education is not evenly distributed. The most selective institutions that do the most to boost their students' future earnings, their student bodies are dominated by wealthy students. And uh, low-income students, students from the bottom income quintile, are almost entirely absent from those campuses. And so I think that's the central, maybe one of the two central reasons why higher education is not functioning for the country as a whole as the engine of social mobility that it was intended to be. The other reason has to do with our public institutions. Public higher education has always been the true engine of social mobility. It's where most American college students go and certainly most low-income American college students. And we have, over the past couple of decades, pulled back resources from that segment of higher education in a way that has changed its role in the, the education system as a whole. It's just much less directed towards the kind of students who need that help the most and much less effective. And so I think those two factors together have made it much more difficult for higher education to work as the producing engine that it can be and should be. Well, let's pull back that a little bit and talk about that. I mean, over the past decade, there have been significant cuts by states to higher education funding. It's an estimated 20% just since 2008. 
And you write about President Obama asking Congress for $12 billion to improve the nation's community college systems. He was turned down. And then as a corollary to that, Harvard raised almost $10 billion in a single capital campaign. I mean, that funding disparity is in a gap halt. That's the Grand Canyon. It's true. And I think both sides of that divide are significant. You know, that among the most wealthy Americans, there is this belief that giving money to the institutions that are that already have the most money, that are already educating mostly very wealthy students, is a, a good philanthropic investment. And on the other side, there is a way that, certainly at the federal level, but in each individual state as well, governments, both Democratic and Republican, have continually made the decision, this is not something that is worth investing in. And all of the signs from the economy, from the labor market, are telling us exactly the opposite that our young people need more higher education, more credentials, more skills. The college wage premium is uh, as high as it's ever been. And so all of those signs are telling one story. The way that we are responding, both on the public and the private side, is the exact opposite. Well, one of the criticisms of media coverage of higher education is that we, education journalists, and then the public also, focuses too much on these elite schools. They educate less than 5% of the college student population. And and we're not giving a lot of attention to, say, the community colleges that serve more than one-third of the undergraduates. Your book certainly focuses a great deal on elite colleges. Why was that appropriate here? I did my best in the book to look at the full landscape of higher education. So I wrote about community colleges, private institutions, flagship public institutions. But you're right, a lot of my reporting was set at some of these uh, highly selective four-year private institutions. And I think they're important for a couple of reasons. One is that during the time that I was reporting, Raj Chetty, the economist, and some of his colleagues came out with this important paper, the Mobility Report Cards paper, that shows how powerful an engine of social mobility those institutions can be. There really is a difference in terms of income boost that students get from those most selective institutions and every other institution. And I think it is really significant that those institutions are not distributing that opportunity evenly in any way. They are using all of those resources to educate a mostly very wealthy student population. So that, to me, is a significant story, not just for those institutions and the students in them, but for a bigger picture of how social mobility functions and doesn't function in our country right now. I want to take a moment to mention that the College Board is one of EWA's many supporters and that EWA retains all editorial control over the content of the EWA radio podcast. Paul, the College Board has pushed back on some of your book's conclusions, including the amount of influence it's had on issues related to equity and college access, and the effectiveness of the organization's efforts to try and help level that playing field. One of the arguments being made by the College Board is that performance on the SAT reflects wider societal inequities, like family income or the quality of a student's K-12 educational experience. What's your response to that? Well, I think it is true that the SAT does correlate highly with family income. But I think the reality is that it correlates more highly with family income than other measures, including high school grades, high school GPAs. And so a system that puts more emphasis on high school grades as a measure of whether students uh, have succeeded in high school and are able to succeed in college, both all the data suggests that that's a more reliable indicator uh, than test scores alone of how well students will do in college, but it's also a more equitable one. High school grades do not have the same kind of drastic correlation with family income that SAT scores do. I spent a lot of time in my reporting among two different groups. One was among uh, affluent students who were going to a, a test prep center in, in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., spending hundreds of dollars an hour to get tutoring to increase their SAT and their ACT scores. And what I saw, you know, in in student after student was that it worked. They got their test scores way, way up, uh, higher than they had come in with. And they were getting into all of these highly selective institutions. And then on the flip side, I spent a lot of time talking to students who were from low-income families who were fantastic students who had great GPAs, great grades, but were not able to get the kind of high, uh, sky-high test scores that these affluent students were getting. And they really suffered in terms of where they were being admitted. And so that was something that I saw in my on-the-ground reporting, but the data supports it. The the SAT is mostly uh, creating obstacles for high-achieving, low-income students who want to 
get the kind of higher education they deserve. And it's giving a leg up to wealthy and advantaged kids who already had a lot of advantages. You know, there's an underlying theme to your book that came to me as I was reading it, and and that is the inestimable value of the personal connection, whether it's the parent who has the ability to help their student get what they need in those early years and then and shepherd them through this college process, or it's a guidance counselor who takes a special interest in a student who might be noticed, or in the case of the, the high-priced tutors that you found in D.C., I mean, a lot of that was about helping these high-achieving students simply manage their anxiety. So much of this depends just on students being able to find somebody who is going to take that kind of one-on-one interest in them and help them. Yeah, and I think there are lots of examples in the book of attempts that various educators have made to automate that process, right? To turn it into something where we can just send information packets or have people watch a video or have people you know, do video chat and sort of automate that process, cheapen that process. And, you know, in lots of ways, that would be nice if we could make it work because it is expensive to have the kind of one-on-one interactions that you're describing. But so far, what the data suggests is that it, that one-on-one process, whether it's a professor, a counselor, a mentor, a parent, Uh, a tutor, that is what makes a difference. And it makes sense. These are teenagers who we're talking about. And this is a fraught time of life. There is a lot that they are dealing with psychologically. Uh, And so just giving them information doesn't seem to be enough. They really need someone to help guide them through these difficult transitions. The good news is that when they get that, when there is an educator or a mentor or a parent or a tutor who is able to take them by the hand and give them the right kind of support, give them a sense that they belong in the community where they're being educated, it can be really transformative. We're talking with education journalist Paul Tuff about his new book, The Years That Matter Most, How College Makes Us or Breaks Us. Don't miss an episode of EWA Radio. You never have to. You can find us on your favorite podcast app. And if there's a story you want to know more about, drop us a line with radio at ewa.org. Paul, we've talked about some of what's in your book, and now I want to turn a little bit to how you did it. What were some of the books and other authors who helped to shape and influence your work here? That's a great question. There, the, a lot of the books that I was reading when I was getting ready to write were not necessarily education books. Uh, one, of the, one of the books that I read just as I was starting to write was The Right Stuff by Tom Wolfe, which is about the race to the moon. It has nothing to do with, with education at all. But w- one of the things that he was trying to do in that book was to both tell a story about you know news and data, but also to bring it to life through the stories of individuals. And that was a lot of what I was struggling with with this book. I mean, there there is a lot of data in this book. There are a lot of studies. There are a lot of experts. But I wanted to tell it as much as possible through the stories of individuals. A lot of students, but also wanted to go deep into the story of, of admissions officers and SAT tutors and uh, psychologists and lots of other people. And so watching as Tom Wolfe combined those two aspects, the sort of hard news aspect and the personal profile side was a lot of what I was trying to aspire to as I wrote the book. The book is really full of memorable characters alongside that complex and often complicated data. And I have to say, there were people who really stuck with me. I mean, even after I finished the book, I found myself thinking a lot about Kim from Taylorsville, North Carolina. She wanted to go to Cornell. She had the grades. She didn't have the money or the support. And she ends up fighting her way to Clemson. Who sticks with you? Um, Kim definitely does. Yeah, Kim is a remarkable character, and it was it was uh, really rewarding to get to know her. I think a lot about uh, Kiki Gilbert, who is um, a student at Princeton, who came from a really uh, chaotic, low income background. Uh, and I think about Yvonne Martinez, the uh, calculus student at the University of Texas, who I profile in the second last chapter of the book. There is something about her experience of making it through that calculus class that not only was uh, kind of emotionally resonant for me when I was watching her do it and talking to her as as she made her way through, but also seems um, significant in a bigger way. She seems to represent, I think, a lot of both the obstacles that we put in the way of low-income students like her and also the potential when we put in a little bit more effort and give those students the support they need. 
Paul, I'm just going to say it. If I was your editor, I would pull out that section on the calculus class, make it a standalone book. That could be a movie on its own. And I, I never thought I would ever say something about that, about a description of a college calculus class and program. Uh, yeah. I, when I started doing that reporting, I felt like, wow, this is, a, this is a good reporting challenge. Can I make a calculus class <laughs> interesting? But it was. I mean, it was the best part of the reporting, the most interesting uh, experience that I had. And it's my favorite chapter in the book. And that had a lot to do with Yvonne. But it also had a lot to do with Uri Treisman and Katie Hogan and Erica Winterer, the three educators who ran that class. And they were inspiring to watch, but they were also so thoughtful and expressive about what they were doing. And so I would sort of go back and forth between sitting there watching one of these classes and being incredibly confused by the actual calculus, and then afterward talking to the students and talking to the educators and understanding what was going through their minds while the class was taking place. It was challenging to try to write that up, but it was, it was a lot of fun too. I'd like to hear a little bit about your process for that. Do you spend a lot of time on the research and then go look for the exact person that might symbolize that finding? Or did the premise of the book evolve as you sort of found these people and spent time with them over this six-year period? I think more the latter, though definitely a little of both. One of my aspirations, at least with this book, was not to just try to find characters that sort of fit neatly into a particular narrative slot, because I felt like... Yeah, these stories were complicated enough that I wanted to let the students drive them. And I mean, that that's true, for instance, of Kim. Like, you know, I use Kim, this young woman from Taylorsville, North Carolina, who ends up at Clemson. I use her in the middle of this chapter about this important experiment by Carolyn Hawksby and Sarah Turner, two education economists, to send packets, information packets to high achieving, low income students to try to change their behavior. And then that experiment was replicated by the college board with less impressive results. And so I was trying to figure out what I thought about that experiment. And I thought Kim as sort of, uh, you know, a typical student who would have received one of these packets was going to be a good way to tell that story. And her story is kind of confusing. You know, it doesn't say like, yes, the packets are a great idea or no, the packets were a terrible idea. It was clear that she could have used more information when she was a high school senior. It was also clear that there was a lot going on in her life and with her family that couldn't be addressed by one you know, small information packet. But one of the things that I tried to do in that chapter especially was not resolve that tension. And, you know, I think I think potentially that can be frustrating to a reader who just wants the perfect character who proves or disproves the thesis. But I wanted to let the complexity of these individuals and these characters drive the narrative more than sort of finding the perfect character that proved some point. You spend time with Angel Perez, an enrollment manager at Trinity College in Connecticut. He's really struggling to bring in more deserving students, but he also has to balance the books. How did you convince them to pull back the curtain there? I just asked. Um, so, I mean, I think Angel is someone who is very committed to his job and very committed to Trinity as an institution, but he is also, he really cares about the field as a whole. And I think a lot of enrollment managers feel a lot of frustration because of the disconnect between the way that the public is led to believe admissions works uh, as this something that is just sort of a consideration of merit uh, and not concerned with money at all, and the actual pressures that exist in their job, which are financial more than anything else. And I think Angel thought that it was important for a journalist and for readers to understand those tensions, not again, not specific to Trinity, but true for the field as a whole. So I'm grateful to him for pulling back that curtain. I think it wasn't an easy decision on his part. But I think in the end, that picture gives a portrait of him and of Trinity and of the whole field of enrollment management that is more honest and that actually, I think, makes me more sympathetic, more empathetic with what enrollment managers are dealing with. You previously worked in broadcast specifically with This American Life. Do you bring any of that skill set with you into your writing? My work with This American Life was a long time ago. It was uh, 20 years ago that I was a full-time employee there. I've done some stories for them over the years. I was there in the late 90s working with Ira Glass and Julie Snyder and Alex Bloomberg and lots of other now really central figures in the radio and podcast journalism world. And it was an amazing training just in journalism, just in how to do interviews, how to think about characters, how to find sources, and how, how to think about narrative in a different way. You know, I feel like 
print people and radio people are in some ways in exactly the same business, but they think about everything a little bit differently. They think about interviews differently. They think about the quality of stories, how stories are structured and developed. And so I've stayed mostly in print journalism. That's, you know, I still, I think, care more about books uh, and magazine articles than I do about podcasts and radio shows. But the experience of going through that kind of radio boot camp with those amazing teachers gave me, I think, a, a sort of additional understanding of how to tell stories, how to use interviews, how to, how to explore characters in more depth that I use in my print writing all the time. You spent much of your career writing about education, but you had a somewhat mixed experience yourself with higher education. You left Columbia in your freshman year and then transferred to McGill University in your native Canada, but you didn't graduate. Has that influenced the lens that you brought to this book? I think so. I'm still trying to sort through that period in my life, as a lot of us are. Um, but I think it did. I mean, I, I don't write about it in this book. I did write about it in How Children Succeed. But one of the reasons I didn't write about it in The Years That Matter Most is that I don't think there's sort of a simple lesson that you can take from my experience. And if there was, I worry that it would be a lesson that I don't actually want to want to teach anybody. I mean, the, the sort of knee-jerk reaction to my experience is, well, you don't need a college degree, right? You can go and have a journalistic career and be a writer with without a college degree. And in my case, that was true. But I don't think that you can really extrapolate from my experience to the experience of lots of other people. That was a strange time. I got lucky in all kinds of ways. So that's why I don't write about it. But I think actually the way that it contributed to this book was that early on, I was trying to understand this kind of like existential debate that we have in this country about whether college is worth it. And it often plays out on cable news shows and, you know, in, uh, on op-ed pages and mostly with a lot of sort of partisan vitriol. And my sort of cultural class is mostly the pro-college class. Um, and certainly the data suggests like a college degree is a very valuable thing. And for almost every student, it's the right choice. But, you know, when I was in Taylorsville, North Carolina, where Kim Henning's family was, there is a ton of skepticism about higher education. That was what she was facing in her family and in her community. People saying, like, why would you go to college? It's a total waste of time. And, you know, no one really succeeds. There are lots of other options. I feel like I was sympathetic to that argument in a way that I think a lot of people in my sort of cultural class are not. I, I wish there were options for students growing up in places like Taylorsville that don't go through a college classroom because I was never very happy in college classrooms. And so that, I think, is the one perspective that being a college dropout gave me on college. Are there some stories you'd like to see higher education reporters tackling? Are there topics you feel are going undercovered? Yeah, lots of them. <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it is such a complicated process that I feel like the advantage that I had was just having lots of time to report. And I think that gave me two two opportunities. One is it let me, you know, do that Tom Wolf trick of going really deeply into individual characters' lives. I could, especially since these were young people, I could watch their lives unfold over time and say, yeah, this is what they were doing a year ago and two years ago, which is a rare privilege for a journalist to be able to do that. But I think it also gave me the opportunity to look more carefully and skeptically at the way that institutions were reporting data. So the College Board, this was certainly true with a number of their interventions that I was able to follow over time and, and sort of dig more deeply into than a daily reporter with a daily deadline would have been able to do. But I think it was true with the data that came out of individual colleges, of various experiments that different uh, researchers were doing. Being able to follow that story over time, I think, is really valuable. So I don't think there's any one particular study, one particular story that I feel like higher education reporters should be putting more focus on. But I think the ability to follow those sorts of interventions and experiments over time was a really valuable privilege that I had with this book. Let's fast forward a little bit. You're getting ready to update the book for the paperback version. You need to add a couple of chapters. Is one of them going to be titled Varsity Blues? <laughs> uh, wait, I have to write more? I, I don't want to update it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I wrote a little bit about the Varsity Blues scandal in the second chapter of the book, but it mostly came out just as I was finishing my writing. I don't think there's a whole lot more that I want to say about it. I think it was 
useful in focusing the mind and helping readers and, and everybody understand just how crazy the competition among affluent parents for slots for their kids in selective institutions had become. In some ways, I feel like it is the misbehavior by those parents was the extreme example that shone a light on the kind of totally legal craziness among affluent parents that I wrote about in my book. So I, I'm not looking to write a, a new chapter about that particular scandal. I think it's important, but I think the more important stories are the more widespread advantages that wealthy parents and wealthy families and wealthy students have every day. Paul Toff is an education journalist and the author of three books, including The Years That Matter Most, How College Makes Us or Breaks Us. Paul, thanks for making time for EWA Radio. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed the conversation. And that wraps up another episode for us. The mission of the Education Writers Association is to strengthen the community of education journalists and improve the quality of education coverage. For more than 70 years, EWA has helped reporters get the story right. Have a great week, and thank you for listening.